If summer heat and activity left your lawn with bare patches and thin spots, then get Scott's Turf Builder Grass Seed. Fall's cool air and warm soil make it the best time to grow grass. Use Turf Builder Grass Seed to grow thicker, greener grass, guaranteed. It contains Scott's exclusive Water Smart Plus coating that absorbs two times more water than uncoated seeds. Feeds to jumpstart growth and protect seedlings against disease. And Scott's is the official lawn care company of Major League Baseball. Fall's the best time to grow seed and repair your yard. Pick up a bag of Scott's Turf Builder grass seed today. This is the Scott's Yard. Want an easy way to see if you could save money on car insurance? GEICO gives you three. Call 1-800-947-AUTO. Go online to GEICO.com or stop by the GEICO office nearest you. Three ways you could save 15% or more. Here we are. Good morning. We're back in Better Than Ever. Mike and Mike presented by Progressive Insurance. Our guests on the Shell Pennzoil performance line. And so it is the best time of the sports year. All four major sports in action at once. And interesting goings on in all of them. Here we go. Brady plays tonight. The American League plays today. Everything we know about basketball may soon be changing. And a record I thought was unbreakable is about to fall in hockey. Golik, what a time this is to be alive. This is a great time. Absolute great time. You just turned the, turned the channel last night, and uh, I actually wasn't watching movies. I was watching all sports last night. Connor McDavid with a hat trick. I mean, it was this kid, what is he, 12? Yeah. It's ridiculous what he's doing, but, I mean, it, it's, it's been a joy to watch. I remember there was a time when I first started in this business before they moved up the start of the NBA season, which they've now done, and before they moved back the end of the baseball season, which they've now done, where we would always say that the weekend of the NFL draft was the one right. time that all four major sports were quote-unquote in action because the basketball or the hockey was going on, the baseball season had begun, and at least you had the football of the draft. But right now, by them moving the start of the NBA and the NHL up as early as they have, the NBA regular season begins in less than two weeks. The NHL regular right. season began Sorry, last, last night. night. The football is obviously going on. The baseball is obviously going on. We have that right now. We actually have, and we will for every October in for in the foreseeable future, we have all four majors going it's awesome. at once. How it great is, is it? It's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it really is. Uh, and I, so I want to dive right into it because I have so many a lot to get, to get through, through yeah. today. So top, let's top. start by looking at the baseball games that will be played today. Game one, Red Sox Astros is the first game, and that will be Sale and Verlander. How about that? What a matchup there! Yeah. Verlander, one ninety two ERA since the All Star break, five and zero with a one oh six ERA in his five starts with the Astros. You think that's worked out pretty well? His postseason, he started out slow, but his first eight career uh, postseason starts. But the last eight, he's picked it up, went from a 5.57 ERA to a 1.76. Chris Sale, he looked to, to be the uh, the, the uh, Cy Young winner in the AL. I mean, all the way up till we started talking about it in August 1st, and that he kind of had this thing going. And then all of a sudden, my Indians smoked him on that day. Yep. And he's had a home run issue kind of since then. He'll probably finish second now to Corey Kluber from the Indians, who's not starting on game one, as we'll get to. But this is a great matchup. Off the top. Let's get to that now. Trevor Bauer will do the pitching for the Indians today against Sonny Gray of the Yankees. That's game one this evening. Remember, every pitch of the postseason is here on ESPN Radio. Sonny Gray, it's his third uh, career postseason start, 486 ERA in his three starts against the Indians. This year, Bauer, 242 ERA since July 27th. Never thrown... More than four and two thirds. It's his fifth career postseason start. Never more throw more than four and two thirds. By the way, that would have been long into the game. These last these two wild card games, if he went four and two thirds, everybody said, "Wow, that that started went far." Seriously, <laughs> and that, that would be a bridge too Off far the top, at this the point. Top. Congratulations yep. to the Minnesota Lynx. They beat the Sparks last night to win their fourth WNBA championship. Yeah, pretty impressive. This was, a, by the way, overall, the third straight uh, WNBA finals decided by the winner-take-all game five. Sylvia Fowles from Minnesota, 17 points, a finals record, 20 rebounds, became the fifth player in WNBA history to win MVP and finals MVP in the same season. Oh, by the way, with her MVP, she has two finals MVP and three defensive player of the year awards as well. Off the top. The Tonight, top. you get Lamar Jackson on ESPN. Now, I think he has almost no chance of winning the Heisman yeah. this year. But any chance he has would certainly be bolstered by a huge national TV performance tonight against NC State. Yeah, and they're ranked now number 24 as NC State, but they've lost five straight games uh, played when ranked in the AP poll. 
though the Louisville not much better. Their uh, Cardinals are 0-6 all-time in ranked road matchups. But the fun one to watch is obviously Lamar Jackson, who's had 10 games in his career where he's been responsible for four touchdowns. I mean, he he I, I'm with you. I don't think he's winning it this year like he did last year, but he is exciting to watch. I don't think he's winning it because he won it last year. Yeah. I, I think that whether it should or shouldn't be the case, there will be a bias against a, a reigning or a, a previous Heisman winner, right. reigning or otherwise, right. um, because it's only happened once before. I, I think he would have to be so far head and mm-hmm. shoulders above Agreed. any other candidate to win it. It's not whether he deserves it or not, but he's already got one in top, his house. Uh, all right, a f- NFL action tonight. As I mentioned, you get Brady tonight, you get Jameis tonight. It's the Patriots and the Buccaneers and the kickoff of Week 5. And it's a defense we're looking at for the Patriots. They've given up 128 points in the first four games, which is one shy of the 1987 Giants for the most by a defending Super Bowl champ. So that's what has been the issue for them. We're going to talk to Rob Ninkovich today, two-time Super Bowl champ from the Patriots, about that because it's been on the defensive side. We talk about not setting you know, the edge on that line, the miscommunication in the secondary. So he'll be someone very good to talk about how he, Matt Patricia, the defensive coordinator, will go about fixing the issues that they have. You know, it's interesting. And you're Ninkovich, 930 Eastern this morning. The one thing I'll, I'll ask you is I have more confidence in Belichick's ability to fix whatever problems seem to be obviously taking place in their secondary with communication than I necessarily do, as I brought this up with you briefly yesterday, and the fact that Tom Brady has been sacked 13 times in four games. Yes, he has. That's on a pace to be sacked 52 times. I know he's superhuman, but he's 40 years old. you got to hit that many yeah, times well, like this is going to be a problem. I saw a couple of years ago that was the reason they didn't go as far as they could have. He was getting knocked around when they had all the different O-line combinations out there. Uh, so that is an issue. But you know what? You know who's not the problem at all? And I know you're not saying he is. It's Tom Brady. Right. I'm worried about they can fix the communication issues. I'm worried about them setting the edges on that defensive line. That's more of a physical thing and play where communication and miscommunication, that can be corrected. And Off the top. Finally, the top. that brings us to last night's National League Wild Card game. The Diamondbacks advance. They beat the Rockies. So both home teams wind up winners, and let's start the conversation there. Off the top, Mike and Mike and what everyone's talking about. Brought to you by O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices every day. What a crazy game last night, capping off what were consecutive crazy nights where you had basically no performances from the starting pitchers. It's it's bordering on ridiculous. But Jeff Passan had a good tweet this morning, or late last night, I should say. Madison Bumgarner, yeah. last year, threw more innings by himself in the National League wildcard game than all four starters this year. They played, uh, San Francisco played the Mets, he threw nine innings. The four starters in the two wildcard games threw seven and a third. Gray last night just made it, what, an inning and a third. Granke, who started out, you know, mowed him up, uh, you know, one, two, three in the first couple innings, and in the fourth inning, he gave up four runs, and that was it for him. It was his shortest outing at three and two-thirds innings in a postseason start. So it's been ugly, really ugly with the starting pitchers. Last night there were 14 pitchers used. Uh, I believe it was eight by Colorado and uh, and six by Arizona. So it was, it was, again, an ugly thing. Started out really ugly for Colorado. No sooner were the announcers saying that Paul Goldschmidt had gone 0 for his last 17 than he was going yard. I mean, it was literally not out of their mouth that he went yard with two on and they were up 3 nothing. His home run made him 8 for 17 with three homers and nine RBIs in his postseason career. So Goldschmidt is obviously money in these playoffs. And Archie Bradley became the first relief pitcher in postseason history to hit a triple. This is one of my favorite stats. He's the first reliever to hit a triple in postseason history. Other pitchers to hit triples in postseason games include Babe Ruth, Cy Young, and Tom Glavin. So we had a lot of weird things that happened in the game last night. And through the two wildcard games, again, this is a microcosm. It's an exaggerated microcosm, but it is a microcosm of the game of baseball, where it is, and why some people are a little bit worried about it. Relief pitchers recorded 80 of the 102 outs. Again, that's that's disproportionate. That's these were crazy. Right, games. right, right. But that it still is. A, it shows you that the difference in how many guys are coming in out of the pen and why. Because the average fastball thrown by a relief pitcher in these two games was ninety six miles an hour, and thus 
Both games took over three hours and 50 minutes to play. But what we did see last night, you know, we normally see that home run or strikeout. There were, now there were, what were there, uh, 17 strikeouts last night. But there were 30 hits. Four home runs, 30 hits. And and the term that Hembo used before the show we were talking, Arizona, they rake it. They can rake the ball. They are ridiculous. They had 17 hits. Their top six in the order went 14 of 29, scored all 11 runs, had six RBIs. I mean, they were just incredible. And four triples. Yeah, they had four triples in the game last night. The last time a postseason team had four triples in a game, the Boston Americans, I see the smile on Golick's face. I can't wait to hear the names. Let me tell you quickly, the Boston Americans had five triples each in games five and seven of the first ever World Series in 1903 against the Pirates. That was the last time and the only time that any team had as many as four triples. So last night was the first time in 114 years that a team had four triples in a postseason game. So, Golik, I didn't know you had done this. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Let me hear who was on the 1903 Boston American. If you'll indulge me for a couple of minutes. Please. The last time, again, four triples in the game, the 1903 Boston Americans. Their first baseman was named Candy Lachance. <laughs> he earned his that, nickname. Yeah, go ahead. I'm because sorry. he preferred to chew on peppermints rather than chewing tobacco. Oh, I can't. So, safety reasons. So, just maybe more candy. Vis- visit the dentist than anything else. Sure. But right? you tell me what Candy Lachance sounds like now. You tell well, me, oh, you tell me what sort of establishment it is you're going to to see Candy That's Lachance. That's exactly before. right. Not uh-huh. a baseball game. No, it is not. Go ahead. Somewhere where we were in. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 go ahead. Their second baseman, Hobie Ferris. Hobie Ferris. Hobie Ferris, who is best known for run-ins with umpires and his own teammates. (laughs) He was a bit of a hothead. A hothead was Hobie. Yeah, yeah. They had an outfielder named Patsy Doherty, who was described as having a moon face. (laughs) He ran in some bad luck during the 1910 season, missing over 20 games due to malaria. (laughs) You don't see that much anymore. We don't have a lot of that, no. And they had another outfielder named Chick Stahl. Who entered pro baseball despite his father, despite his father's best efforts to keep him in the family carpentry business. <laughs> if the name sounds familiar to me, and it does, that's because he coached Notre Dame's baseball team in 1900. That's re- Chick Stall. Chick Stall. Think about that. In those days, you were better off being in the carpentry business than you were being a baseball player. Well, honestly, you were better off just running into Chick Stall and Candy LaChance, as you said, somewhere else. That's probably right. <laughs> All right, so there's just a little taste of the 1903 yeah. Americans, mm-hmm. and now that leaves us with four teams remaining in the American and four teams remaining in the National League. Meanwhile, the question to Mark Deschera is why are these starting pitchers so brutally bad through two games of the playoffs? I'm not sure exactly what happened. I think maybe some guys were a little too amped up. I mean, Severino and Gray are young guys. They were probably a little too amped up, lost the field. But there, there's no excuse for guys like Grinky and, and Urban Santana, veterans that have been in the playoffs for years. These guys didn't pitch well either. So for me, I don't know exactly um, you know, how to, to, to put my thumb on what happened to these guys, but they were terrible. They were, and it's certainly been an issue, and we'll see where it goes starting tonight with the starting pitchers. But I tell you, Colorado, who looked to be completely out of this one, certainly made it a game. They're down after three, six to nothing. You're thinking, oh, man, after, especially after that first inning. But they put up four in the, the fourth inning, which, which runs Granke out of the game, and they actually had it down to a one-run game before I think it was A.J. Pollock from Notre Dame. Yeah. Uh, hit a two-run double, and they added another one to uh, score three in the bottom of the eighth uh, to get the 11-8 to, to eight win. So it turned out to be a little more of an exciting game, which you thought Arizona was just going to run away with it. You know, I mean, uh, offense, games that get broken open like this, um, as an exception, not as a rule, I do think are fun and exciting. I think people like to see a lot of scoring. If every game was 11-8, to 8, I don't think it would be great. I think the occasional 11-8 right. to 8 game is fine. But what I do think you miss, if this is what we're going to get here, is the biggest star in, the, the two biggest stars in baseball, traditionally, for 150 years. I'm not going to use it. It's not about individual names. I'm talking about the two different people who can become the biggest stars. Are the slugger? Yeah. And the dominant pitcher. Yeah. Right? The biggest stars in baseball history are Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, et cetera, and the great pitchers. Right? So you go to a baseball game, you, you, you watch a, a postseason baseball game, and what do you remember? If you're old enough, you remember Sandy Koufax, and you remember Bob Gibson. You and I aren't old enough for that. But I remember Oral Hershiser and these unbelievable performances and other great starting pitchers through the years. Greg Maddox, did he have his struggles in the postseason? Let's see what he can do. Randy Johnson, at first he couldn't win a playoff game. Then he was unbelievable. Pedro 
Pedro Martinez. You want to see the legendary starters. Yeah. It, there's, there's just something about watching five consecutive guys coming out of the bullpen for an inning each throwing 100 miles an hour that just isn't as romantic as that. I agree. So I, I do think that is – it's a problem. There's, it's, it's a problem that cannot be solved. There's nothing they can do about it. This is where the game is now, and it's how you're going to win games, and so every team is going to do it. But if you start to lose a little bit of that, you lose a little bit of the romance of the sport. Well, I, well listen, it'll show. Do, do, does it cost you, though? Does it cost you in ratings? Does it cost you in attendance? That, that's what matters. I mean, you could, we can sit there and be, you know, oh, man, forlorn. We really wanted that. But if it's not affecting the business of the game, then so be it. But I'm with you. I mean, who doesn't uh, uh, – sail and Verlander tonight? Right. I mean, you want to see him into the seventh, eighth inning. I mean, you would love to see that because you're right. It was those guys, and then you had that hard throwing closer that came in and ended the game for you. That's right. You know, and you, you just you just don't have that now. Now you certainly you absolutely do need a scorecard to keep track of the pitchers that are coming in. So, but this is where we are. You know, it, it, it's we, you can't be that you know old guy again. You know, get off my yard. I mean, you may not like it, but it is where we are. No, clearly, it's not even a question of get off my yard it's more a question of if this is the direction the sport is going it is a fundamental change it's yeah. a bigger change than i think is being discussed outside of baseball sabermetrician hardcore fan circles like i don't think this is something people are talking a lot about but as this postseason goes on maybe they will I mean, the biggest stars in the game and the highest paid players in the game are starting pitchers yes uh, clayton kershaw and tonight verlander as you mentioned and they're actually a late afternoon game but you know what i'm saying Frankie on the mound last night yeah and, and you know and you get three and two thirds yeah. innings you want to yeah. see that guy you want to see that manager making that decision on whether to take him out of the game in the eighth yeah not in the fourth yep so it just is a little bit of a, a sign of the times and that's where we are with the sport as far as where these teams go now the Yankees advance the Diamondbacks advance through this round and our Eduardo Perez says maybe those teams at this point have the advantage I've always said a team that wins a wild card game I believe has an advantage because in baseball you need to play every day uh, to, be, to be able to have your timing you can have a day off here and then play a day off but with the Dodgers they're having a few days off and I wonder how their timing will be the first, not only first time around the lineup, but the second time also. Um, it's going to be interesting with Clayton Kershaw taking them out, and now most likely it won't be Robbie Ray, but still it'll be a very competitive Arizona Diamondback team. Eduardo said this on uh, Freddie and Fitz on ESPN Radio. I don't want to hear it, Eduardo. The Indians will be just fine, okay? All right, thank you very much. Go look the way, confident. Hembo absolutely says Diamondbacks are beating the Dodgers. Absolutely says that's happening. So we'll they, see. They, I mean, they, 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 uh, they had the edge in the regular 11 season. 11 to 8. Right? Yeah. 11 to 8. Yeah. Yeah. They hit the ball so well. well look, the Dodgers, the Dodgers and the Indians, who are, who are the two one seeds, could not have had more different seasons. Yeah. Um, the Dodgers were the best team, not only in the sport, but one of the two or three best teams ever through about the first, right. what, 100 or so games, 110 games. Oh, we kept talking about are they going to challenge the Mariners in 116 wins. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they couldn't beat anybody. Right. And then and they sort of righted the ship a little bit at the end. Mm-hmm. And then the Indians were good through the year. And, and then what they and, went, what they wound up winning, 22 games in a row, whatever it was. Yeah, it's 22, they I believe. They had that yeah. ridiculous winning yep. streak, and they've been almost unbeatable. Right. Ever since then. So well, let's see what happens. Once you get into the playoffs, you don't need me to tell you, everything everything right. sort of gets washed away. Uh, there's, there are no shockers left, right? No. Boston-Houston, to me, is a toss-up. Whoever comes out of that series, I'm not surprised. Exactly. Yankees, Indians, I'd favor the Indians, but not 70. Well, we know 30. who's favored, but but you're right. In none of these series would we go, oh my God, this is one of the greatest up- series upsets we've ever no, seen. Absolutely no, not, because these are all good teams. Right. I mean, I, I would right. give the the Indians a, a 55 45 edge or yeah. something like that, 60 40 tops, uh, no more than that. So anything can happen, and that's a good thing. To me, that's a good thing. You've got a lot of good teams left, you've got um, a lot of big names relative to where the sport is right now left. I'd like to see this starting pitchers go deeper but if they're not going to they're not going to if that's not what the game is now that's not what right. the game is now we got we got good stuff to watch here we got two games today we got four games tomorrow uh, so we're all excited about it and again everything every pitch is heard right here on espn radio mike and mike presented by progressive insurance you can save hundreds on your car business or recreational vehicle insurance from a local independent agent go to progressive.com today now that's Progressive. You looked like you had something else. You I was just going to gonna say. I, I think the biggest question is going to be how is Gary Sanchez? Right? Did you see his tweet? No, he I tweeted didn't. that he's okay. I have. He yes, did. I, okay, I have an update for you. Okay. <laughs> I have a Gary Sanchez update. For okay, you. Gary Sanchez, catcher for the Yankees, took a foul tip. I mean, square 
right where any guy does not want anything to happen. And, and I, as soon as I brought it up, here comes the B-roll again if you're watching. We, spent, gonna, we, we have more we, angles, more of angles this thing. on this. You, you could do a replay on this and have every angle, especially in slow motion. Everything is oh. moving. It's just horrific. So, quite honestly, it's always like, okay, you get injured. How do you feel the next day? So, I didn't know he tweeted. He tweeted yesterday. Um, the the best I'm picture, I'm sorry. The, oh, here it yeah, is. Yeah. He, he tweeted yesterday, 10.35 a.m., okay. so a half hour after our show. Okay. Um, and what he did was he tweeted a picture of Robertson's reaction. Yeah. But for those of you who didn't see this, and if you're watching on ESPN2, you're seeing it. Robertson, the, pit, the guy who threw the, pitch, threw the pitch, he has the best view of this of anybody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And his immediate reaction, I think David Ross said he, th- he thinks he threw up into his glove. Oh, yeah. He puts his glove up over his he face. Put, he puts his hand in a... Well, he put his hand exactly where any guy would because knowing what just got smashed. He, he looks like Michael Jackson in the, yeah. the Billy Jean he video. But you're right. Either way, uh, what Gary Sanchez tweeted was, when your teammates feel for you with a smiley face, then I am okay. And then he also put it in Spanish, cuando te compañero la siente por ti, estoy bien, mi gente. So he's basically telling everybody, it's funny. My jewels are fine. He appreciates David Robertson and everyone else's concern, right. and he's fine. Okay. Could you imagine if you took another one off of him? Well, I mean, it is, I mean, it is not inconsistent. No, it's not. You've got to go up there, <laughs> and you've got to get into that position yeah. again. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of hard like getting right picture. back on that horse, huh? That's... <laughs> Get right back down in that stance. I will say this. He may never ride a horse again. Wow. <laughs> but that's if that was something there, he ever did I mean, in the first place. Is there place. any way where he can comfortably double cup it? I, I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Listen, I mean, I'm, Titanium. A single, I'm a single cupper when I'm covering yeah. these games. I'm not even playing. <laughs> Mike and Mike were presented by Progressive Insurance. Jam-packed guest list today on the Shell Pennzoil performance line, including, as Golik mentioned, Rob Ninkovich late in the show today talking about the struggles of the Patriot defense and a whole lot more. We mentioned we got every sport going on. We got Brady playing tonight we got everything about basketball may soon be changing i'll get into that a record that i thought was unbreakable is about to fall in hockey and up next mikey's on his way right mike will yes, be yes, here he the golics are going to teach me and maybe all of us something about football i mean that seriously because there's something that needs to be explained to me okay keep your eyes closed okay i want to show you my first ever painting Ooh, all right okay open your eyes oh that's a lot of colors mm-hmm. <laughs> and shades. So be honest. What do you think? Well, uh, I like how if you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Here, why don't I hold your paintbrush while you call them? Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Again, these games were were disproportionate to the reality. Starters are not always going to you know go a third of an inning and one and a third and all that kind of thing. But with the de-emphasis, if you will, on starting pitching and the extraordinary emphasis on having five guys in your bullpen that can throw one inning of 100 miles an hour at a time, what it might do, one of the things if you're looking at it from a positive side, is it might kind of even the playing field from a salary standpoint. Because all of a sudden, every team can afford that. Mike and I are are, are guys who are old enough to remember, basically, your bullpen was full of failed starting pitchers. Exactly. Right? If you weren't quite good enough to make it as a starter, you became a relief pitcher in baseball. Every now and again, you had a specialist who was the closer. But even most closers started out as starters and, and sort of found their way there. Now I think young kids, high school age kids or whatever, are figuring out. If you can throw 100 miles an hour, you don't have to be able to sustain it. You just have to be able to do it for about 20, 25 pitches, and you can make a couple of million bucks in Major League Baseball. Not 30, right. but you can make a couple, and that's a hell of a lot more than nothing. Oh, yeah, way more than relievers were used to being paid. Yeah. So, so the Dodger payroll is $241 million. The Diamondbacks payroll is $93 million. But the, the bullpens are sort of the great equalizer right. in all of this, right? So in some ways, if you're looking at it that way, is, is could we, we spin it in sort of a positive fashion? Yeah, as far as the health of the sport, and I think it becomes interesting with just baseball because a lot of times in other sports I'll talk about this sort of misnomer that parity is something we actually want because in general, I think the NFL is a good example where early in the season when you see teams that we aren't used to being on top of things or being better than 
expected and the brand names suffer a little bit, we tend to say, oh, what's wrong with the NFL right now? This seems a little bit off because we like to see the brand names. We like to know what we can trust in most sports. But with how regional baseball is, I wonder if there is some room for this, with this idea that you can have teams in smaller markets like Milwaukee or Arizona or things like that that might be able to benefit from this being the model because it's making, you know, we had uh, Hembo was on first and last this morning and pointed out that strikeouts and the time of the games are both at all time highs at this point, and they aren't necessarily things that lend itself to the overall model ratings wise. But for a sport that's as regional as baseball, maybe this does play. You know, and I wonder from the physical side of it. You know, what did we talk about for a while, Green? You've been doing the show long enough. The spate of Tommy John surgery yeah. going on. Yeah, would this lessen it? Now your starters. See, see I don't know. I, I would need someone to 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 better fill me in on this. For starters, they're throwing less innings. So we're down to the average of five innings. So by that note there, they're throwing less. So maybe that's saving their arm. And then the relievers, I mean, they're not throwing a ton, but they are throwing hard. I mean, they are insanely the hard. Yeah. Insanely. So does that negate the, the, the fact that they're not throwing as long as far as the, the for Tommy John surgery in the elbow? I don't know that. But I don't either. it's something obviously will be easily easy to track you've had the surgery you didn't have the surgery what injuries come along with it if injuries go down or up or where they might go it just i feel like pitching used to be a little bit of an art form like there was a little bit of an art to it and now it's Blast really it. just pure throw it as hard as you can and that was the interesting part i heard david ross on with you guys yesterday and he basically hinted at it yeah. like there used to be this sort of now it's paint by the numbers where it used to be like a picasso where you would have to kind of feel it out and you wonder what kind of effect that has long term because like anything else in sports, things get figured out and they sort of recorrect. And so eventually I have to imagine this style is going to get more figured out on the hitting side of things and offense will you know, compensate for what the defense has now started to put up. But we've seen in football, like people lament spread offense as kind of dumbing down what's expected of quarterbacks. And you wonder if this dumbs down what's expected of your starting pitchers to a point that comes back to bite you later on if this becomes a more prevalent way of doing things on the lower levels where maybe you aren't riding the singular talent of one arm as much as you are developing this across the board. Because to your point, it's a lot easier to find eight or nine kids that can do this instead of one ace that's going to carry you the whole way. That's exactly right. That one guy costs you, you know, $30 million. You can get five guys and pay less than that in total in Major League Baseball to to round out a bullpen, and you see how it works anyway. So we got the two American League games today, all four series in action tomorrow, every pitch here on ESPN Radio. Let's move forward to a couple other things. Obviously, the Cam Newton conversation is something that everyone is talking about. We'll get to that in a couple of minutes. But I really, in all sincerity, would like you guys to explain something to me that I'm having a difficult time understanding, and I don't think I'm alone in this. So, and I, I was reading, I saw Ha Ha Clinton Dix tweeting about this yesterday, and I'm reading this. Peter King interviewed a ton of football players about the Danny Trevathan hit. And again, most people saw it because it was standalone Thursday night game. Trevathan with, with, with what looked like to me, whether it was intentional or not, just a brutal and vicious hit on Devontae Adams, who, if that doesn't meet the definition of a defenseless player, I'm not sure what does. But we, again, maybe I'm prejudicing the conversation ahead of time. And so Peter interviewed a bunch of players. And I will sum up the reaction of most of the players with the reaction of one, Daniel Hunter, who is a Vikings defensive end, who said, quote, he's just trying to help his teammate tackle a dude. I don't think he's trying to do that on purpose. You know, fans, they're going to say whatever. Okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. So explain this to me. With everything I think I know about what the National Football League is trying to do with the, the legislation right. of, of, of the way people hit each other in football, that looks to me like the dictionary definition of what they want out of the sport. It meets every possible criteria. He lowered his head. He hits with the crown of his helmet. He hits him directly in the head. He hits him right in the face. The guy is already being held by another player, so he's kind of stood up in, in a, in a quote-unquote defenseless fashion. To me, take intent out of it. Intent has nothing to do with it. I know he doesn't have a reputation for being a dirty player. But if that isn't something that they're – I mean, they should put that to me – like on the reel of this is what we don't want in football now. So what am I missing? Because all these football players are telling me I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't think that's what they're saying. I think they're speaking to the point the league and the players are going to be at a different side on this because you've got defensive players especially who are always fighting against this thing. And, Dad, you can speak to this now mm -hmm. as someone who's around it before a lot of these rule changes, but defensive players have to feel handcuffed right now. Like a lot of these guys are just trying to figure out where and how they can hit somebody. And to your point, it may not have been intent. Like I'll say the reaction, especially from the Packers, had more to do with the response from the Bears than the actual hit. Those guys getting up and gesturing in a way while their teammate is on the ground not moving that would rightly tick a lot of people off myself included 
But I don't think it had as much to do with the act itself. But to your point, the NFL, if you're really trying to eradicate this, you've got to police it whenever it comes up. And it may not seem fair and it may not seem right at some times, but you can't be concerned with that if your end goal is just trying to eradicate the behavior as a whole. This wasn't about a dirty hit, late hit, defenseless player hit. That What he did was, in my day, a great hit. I mean, a hit that you you woke up in a dream, smiling, saying, I hope to get a hit like that. I hope there is some guy teed up for me yep. to try and destroy him, to hit him as hard as I, as my dad taught me. You run through a guy and tackling him. You drive him and hit him as hard as you can. You drive him into the ground. And if it's a clean, good hit, if he gets up, great. If he doesn't, that's part of the game. So that had been part of the game forever. So to me, it's not about defenseless. It's not about any of that. The whole thing is about dropping his head. That's the whole thing in this. And the league wants it out. And that's the biggest difference of what players, how they're used to tackling and how they want to go about, the, the league wants them to go about tackling right now. To me, that's everything. I don't care that he was held up. The, did the whistle blown? No. If the whistle doesn't blow, smoke a guy. That's just the way it is. And that still should be the way it is. As I said, if he went into that and led with his shoulder and not the top of his head, we would not be having this discussion today. And if we were having this discussion today, I would be standing on this table screaming my fool head off if he got fined or suspended and used his shoulder. That's where we are now in this league. That's what they want, and I understand it. I understand that's what they want, and it's it's guys are already Mike. We're already seeing guys not launch as much over the middle. They want the launching and the head down out. We're seeing less and less in that. Flags are getting thrown. Guys are getting fined, so they are getting that out, and that should be out. You don't want a guy leaving his feet and dropping his head down low. If he uses his shoulder, that's fine. So that's what they want. So to me, this is all about the head drop. He doesn't drop his head. We're not talking about any of this right now and to your point if it's getting better the only way it keeps trending that way is if you keep harping on you it. have to the, you, you have to like you said you, you can't judge intent with this it's just going to be if you violated the letter of the law we're going to come down on you and keep showing everyone not it's not just about coming down on danny trevathan no it's about continuing to send that message like we're not about this anymore because he's a good player he is not a dirty player he did what every single defensive player dreams about this guy is teed up and i can destroy him and there is nothing wrong with that nothing in the game of football except the part about dropping your head they want it out you got to get that out it's causing too much damage whether to the player hitting or the person that's getting hit and they want that out they have to call that one out all right, so I, I hope that that clears something up because I've had a lot of I've seen a lot of fans out there who are dismayed that they reduced the suspension from two games to one. And I was following when when that play actually happened. I wasn't here Friday, but I was watching the game and I saw on social media it, it was like a crime had been committed on the field based upon the hit. And so I think a lot of people are probably a little bit surprised to see most football players, most of the I've seen saying. You know, there really isn't anything wrong with that hit, or, or at least some variation on that. Yeah, well, because I think in general, like, because you saw a lot of the outrage, like, oh, that's disgusting, that has no place in the game, like, that's a dirty play. Like, man, again, like, a lot of people, I, I think, have a difficult time negotiating just how fast these things are happening, and again, just how hard it is for a lot of these defensive guys now to figure out where and how they can hit, all the while when you're told fi finishing is a mentality. But you can keep your head up. That's the whole thing. He can come in there a thousand miles an hour looking to, looking to hit a guy and the guy's whole uniform go flying off. And that's fine. But keep your head up. Do the Cam Newton and the uh, Ben Roethlisberger mm -hmm. discussions off the top of the hour when we can do them justice and have plenty of time. But let's do some over-unders here, guys. So we got Sonny Gray pitching tonight in game one of the ALDS in Cleveland. He averaged six innings per start. The Yankee bullpen obviously was taxed beyond belief right. the other night. So the over-under is five innings. Under. How long he will last tonight. Under. And the Indians. And knock him out of the game without question. It's under. Seems, seems like a little bias built into this one, it but is. I'm going to hand him the under based on recent memory. I mean, from what we've seen in the first couple of games here, I'd like to believe that this is part of the trend we've seen for most of the season. Yeah, until I see a pitcher, a starting pitcher in the sixth inning, yeah. I won't believe it's allowed. I also will go <laughs> under. Next, over under Mike Golick Jr. on the number of times that Tom Brady will be sacked tonight is one and a half. He's been sacked 13 times in four games on pace for 52 this year. 
have to imagine this will be the under on this one. Like to the point here, the Bucks have one sack through three games so far this season for dead last. And with a guy like Gerald McCoy on that yeah. D line, that's kind of surprising. But when he's really one of the few guys you have to game plan for, and they should be cognizant of this now, right? Like help that O line out in protection. Do some of the things we see teams do to bolster that. I agree. I think it will be. He's been getting hit, but I think that they, you know, with Skarnicki, the, the O line coach, I think he can do some some good things with them. McCoy, you're right. They have lack of sacks that they have. Though McCoy was in the back to the Giants a yeah. lot oh my God. last week making penetration, but I'll go under on They it. have a lot of injuries on that defensive side of the ball as well. Next, over under on the chance you would give the Warriors to win the NBA title is 93%, and that is because in NBA.com's annual survey of general managers, 93% of them said they think Golden State wins the title. Over under, 93. I, I would go over that. I mean, again, we're, we're assuming everybody's healthy because injuries are great equalizer where you can't start, well, if this guy's hurt or that guy's hurt. Assuming everybody is, stays healthy, I, I would absolutely be over on that. Yeah, I know you got, you balk at the idea of 100% certainty yeah. for anything, but if you wanted to put this number up near there, I'd buy into it with this team. But I will go under for exactly the reason you just pointed out. There is a 7% chance that one of those guys gets hurt. Right? What, what, what are the chances that they lose Kevin Durant or they lose Steph Curry and then they don't win the championship? If they're all healthy, then I would put it as close to 100 as you can get. But because there's a chance that one of them gets hurt, I would put that chance, Mike Golick Jr., at 8%. Uh, you need a couple of those guys to get hurt because if one gets hurt, they're still the 73 win Warriors. Do you think, if, if they, all kidding aside, let's make that the question. If they lost, which one of them could they not afford to lose? Is there any one player, well, if, you, if you took Durant bit, right? off that team, <clears throat> right. but I mean, if he was out for the playoffs, would they still win? I know they won 73 they win without 73 him. without Yeah, him. I think so. That, I don't. That's, listen, they, they kept all the ancillary pieces, too. I, they did. That was a key for that. They kept it. But he was the one I think they couldn't afford to lose. Over anymore. Under is brought to you by Cabbage, who created a simple way for businesses to get flexible access to up to $100,000. That's Cabbage with a K. Everyone talking about Cam. Everyone talking about Ben. We will be next. Mike and Mike.